Hey everyone, the name is Eric Doran. Yes, as you can see, there are moving boxes everywhere right now. We are currently moving closer to Amsterdam, to Amsterdam Lilleland, where yeah, we will live for the next year or so at least. And it will be a great adventure and it's a lot of work and it means less videos. Yeah, I'm sorry, but here we are today. The problem with pride. I want to talk about Enneagram 2, the caregiver, and I want to talk about why pride is not always a positive thing. Yeah, I know a lot of people talk about pride and the importance of being proud, but I want to illuminate some of the issues with pride. In particular, what is the key issue with pride? Why do I talk about it as a iffy thing? It's an iffy thing because it creates often an attachment to behavior that does not give us any joy or energy or enthusiasm. We feel proud when we do things that other people will like that we personally don't get any value or energy out of. The Enneagram 2, the caregiver is pretty much dominated by this kind of behavior. The Enneagram 2 type is attached to behaving in ways that won't give you any form of fulfillment or joy, but will make you feel satisfaction. And here's the positive thing with Enneagram 2, with pride. It's satisfaction. It's satisfaction over having done something good. Yeah, you've done something good. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's something to be happy about. The problem is... It can create a long an attachment to, to behavior that's on a longer perspective often not positive and it can create this experience that can sometimes cloud your judgment yeah often when people talk about the caregiving types and the helper types is that they can become full of this kind of experience that they are in the right and that other people are in the wrong this kind of uh, higher sense of yourself which can sometimes cloud introspection and block you from reaching awareness into things that are less positive. Yeah, often when I speak to the Enneagram 2 types, the most common thing I hear is, I don't really have any weak spots. It's, it can, yeah, like this pride can sometimes create this sense that I don't have any weak spots. No, I don't have an Enneagram type. Enneagram 2 types will often say that I have no Enneagram type because I don't have any problems associated with Enneagram. I don't have any traumas or any issues. So overall, I'm a good person. I do great things. I'm, I'm happy with who I am and with my personal state. And like I say, to some extent, that's a positive thing. There is nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself. There is nothing wrong with the satisfaction of self. The problem is the pride. The problem is the kind of mask of pride and its ability to block introspection and higher awareness. Yeah, often when I talk about Enneagram 2 types, I talk about people to some extent blocked from their dominant intuition or their dominant sensing if they are sensing types. And often uh, the thing here, like, like I said in the beginning, an Enneagram 2 type, a proud person, will do something that won't give them any energy or joy. They will do something to sacrifice for other people. It's a sacrifice when you do it. It's this experience that, yeah, I don't like it, but I'll do it for you. And uh, here, the thing is, intuition, if you're an intuitive type, is your dominant hobby. It's your dominant interest. It's what you like doing. It's what you love doing. And when you engage in intuition, you feel a sense of love for what you do. You see, feel, see, you feel the fun in what you do. You feel the energy in what you do. You feel the stimulation in what you do. And when you're not doing these things, you're not feeling intuition. When you're doing things that give you no joy or satisfaction, you're not feeling intuition. And in not feeling intuition, you're not feeling full openness. You're not feeling full awareness. You're not feeling full energy. The more, less energized we are, the less fun we have, the less we remember from a situation, the less we take away from a situation, the less energy we have, the less attention we pay to the world around us and the less aware we become. And there's how it can cloud your judgment. Here's how uh, doing something that doesn't give you any energy can cloud your ability to gain higher awareness into self. But there is something worse here and here it's uh, important to take into account your subjective opinion of what, of what is fun and what is and gives you control. What I've found is for an intuitive, for say, take an INFJ for example, uh, what gives you energy and rush is to follow your own path and your own vision, to do something that you are passionate about, something that you keep dreaming about, thinking about doing over and over. 
what I found with the Enneagram 2 INFJs is this uh, traditionalist, uh, overly traditionalistic mindset where these INFJs will compromise their idea of what they want to do, their long-term vision, their long-term path. And they will instead do perhaps what their parents think. They will follow some kind of traditional route. They will do what their father would be proud of if they did. <laughs> they would do something their parents would be proud of. They would do something they think other people would be proud of them for. And here's the thing, like what I keep seeing in Enneagram 2 types is this, uh, I've done something good for you. I've sacrificed something for you. Is that not worth anything to you? Yeah, there can be some, there can be some resentment. And here's the, that's the key issue with Enneagram 2 type. This, uh, over the long run, sense of resentment. Because you've done something that you don't like. You've had to compromise your vision. You felt yourself putting aside your ambitions, your visions, your future for somebody else. For uh, perhaps the kids you raised or perhaps the parents that you've sought to help or perhaps the friends that you had in your life that you went and put on a lot of energy for. You can feel a sense of resentment when you don't feel gratitude from the other person. And uh, in this, often a problem people talk about with Enneagram 2 is this desire to kind of control and to demand gratitude. Uh, why aren't you grateful for everything I've done for you? Why aren't you appreciating me for what I've done for you? What do, why don't you see the sacrifices I've had to do for you? And this resentment is not positive for you or for the other person. The control of the two is also very important to talk about. The Enneagram 2 type is a person with generally strong control and a sense of what is right. Enneagram 2 types will often have this idea of what other people need to be happy. Enneagram 2 types will see that, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to get hurt. If my kid goes out and does this, they will get hurt. If the person I'm taking care of does this, they will hurt themselves. Then you're going to go so deep into this role of thinking about what other people find fun and need and to, uh, what they, other people need to be happy. And in this, there is this ability to realize things that will hurt the other person. And in this, there is this tendency to overstep boundaries at times, to overstep boundaries and to prevent the other person from getting hurt. When getting hurt is a necessity of life. Yeah, it's a necessity in the sense that in doing things that will get us hurt, we will realize things about ourselves and what we want and what we need to be happy and to be ourselves. And here's often like something that's necessary to talk about when talking in relation to the two. All of us, anyone that will have kids or anyone that will be in a situation where they have to take care of someone else will sometimes have to respond to these issues, regardless if it becomes a dominant concern if you are an Enneagram 2 type that has done this most of their life, or if you just experience this temporary, all of us will experience situations like this sometimes. And in this, uh, recognizing uh, when you're starting to hold on to resentment that the other person does not deserve, realizing when you're starting to project what you want onto the other person and when you think that they should be doing something and when you realize that you're overstepping boundaries, like when you start thinking and becoming preoccupied with what other people should do to be happy, and you forget, what do I need to be happy? Well, often the realignment, the important realignment is this stepping back into what do I want to be happy? What do I need to do to be happy? What is it that I've kept myself from doing that I need to do to be happy, to get energy and to fulfillment from my life? And here's the important thing, realizing also that it's never too late. There are always ideas waiting for you. There is always a vision waiting for you. There is always a passion waiting for you. It's never too late to go and chase what it is that you've been thinking of doing. You can do it now. You can do it in 10 years. You can do it in 20 years. There will always be new ideas to catch. There will always be new things to pursue. And it's always there is always something for you. All you need to do is ask for it. And also, like, something I found myself wanting to talk about for a long time is the importance of not deflecting kindness. It's something I've just noticed overall, in, over time, that people have a tendency to deflect kindness, deflect compliments from other people, deflect help from other people. When other people are trying to help us, often our initial thought is, like, wanting to help them in return. And here's the thing, like... Let other people help you and realize also the power and the energy and the rush and the satisfaction you give another person in letting them help you. Let other people do something for you 
and realize that that's not a bad thing. You're not hurting them by doing it. You're not damaging them by doing it. You're giving them something. You're giving them some meaning, some value in life, something that makes them feel a sense of passion and purpose. Recognize your own boundaries in what you want to do and who you are compared to what other people want for you and what other people need from you. Recognize the difference in what you want from another person and what they need to have for themselves, what they need to experience. Realize when people are doing stupid things that, yeah, but sometimes they need to do stupid things to figure it out. In all of this, the Enneagram 2 is a type very close to self-actualization. You, as an Enneagram 2 type, you're really, really close to self-actualization, to uh, finding yourself and to being truly in touch with your inner flow. All you need to do is reclaim that intuition or that sensing for yourself, reclaim that hobby and reclaim that vision and realize that vision, purpose, purpose, personal interests, personal hobbies do not come at the expense of other people's interests and other people's hobbies. You can do what you love, you can do what you what makes you happy. And in doing so, you will make other people happy because your ideas and the pursuit of your ideas will come to the benefit of other people. The things that you are passionate about, passionate about will help other people along the way. You don't need to do something that you hate to help other people. You can do something that you love to help other people. I hope this video helped you even if you're an Enneagram 2 or if you're some other type also. Because that's how I want to see it. I want people to understand that all the Enneagram types are relevant to you regardless of where you're coming from. All of these issues and concerns have been in your head at some point and we all need to process through them to see how they inhibit and direct our flow and our personal way of being. So that's all for today. Thank you all for watching and if you want to learn more about the Enneagram types do get the power of persona, do get my books about the Enneagram. Uh, it's really a deep dive into the Enneagrams from different perspectives and it's a connection between Carl Jung's theories on the 12 archetypes and the Enneagrams theories. I am bringing the worlds together and I'm trying to see how they con uh, connect and I'm trying to see how type and Enneagram type intersect. So that's all for now. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next video.